Hello and welcome to the first part of the Advanced Synthetic Aperture Radar webinar series for land cover applications. My name is Dr. Erica Podest and I am a scientist in the Earth Science Division at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory located in Pasadena, California. This series contains two trainings. The first one will be taught by me and it's focused on SAR for flood mapping using Google Earth Engine. And the second one will be on September 4th and will be focused on exploiting SAR to monitor agriculture, which will be taught by Dr. Heather McNairn from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Each webinar is structured so that about 30 to 40 percent is theory and the rest is focused on the demonstration. Today I will begin with SAR theory as related to flooding and I will then go through a demo on how to generate a flood product with Google Earth Engine. Remember, you will be able to access the presentation material and the recordings online in a couple of days. Learning objectives. I expect that by the end of today's webinar, you'll be able to understand the information content in SAR images relevant to flooding and how to use Google Earth Engine to generate a flood map using SAR images. If you've taken the previous SAR trainings, then some of the material that I will be presenting on the theory will be familiar to you and just take it as a refresher. First, I'll define flooding from a radar perspective, which refers to the occurrence of a water surface beneath a vegetation canopy, regardless of whether it is a forest or agriculture. So when I refer to an inundated forest, it means that underneath the vegetation canopy, there is standing water above the soil surface, as shown in the top left figure. In agriculture or herbaceous areas, the leaves or stems of the plants visibly emerge above the water surface as shown in the bottom center figure. Radar can also detect flooding when there is, or where there is no standing vegetation, and I will call this open water. The type of flooding discussed in this webinar can be caused by natural processes, such as the seasonal flooding of wetland ecosystems, or as a result of a natural hazard, such as, for example, hurricanes or extreme precipitation events. Some floods can also be human-driven, such as flooded rice fields. Assessing and monitoring flood extent can help reduce uncertainties in the spatial and seasonal extent of methane sources and sinks associated with wetland ecosystems, or the cultivation of crops that require standing water, such as rice. Also, flood maps can help monitor inundation extent and dynamics for disaster assessment and management. Now, I'll start a refresher on the radar backscattering mechanism in general, with an emphasis on the ones that are primarily relevant to flooded vegetation and open water which I have delineated with red boxes in this figure. So in the far left, there is specular scattering, which occurs when there's a smooth surface, such as a calm body of water, and the signal scatters away from the satellite. In this example, the signal is coming from the left and scattering from the satellite, away from the satellite towards the right. So this results in open water appearing very dark in the image because there is no signal that is returned back to the satellite. The next type of scattering is rough scattering, which results when there is some level of roughness on the surface causing the signal to scatter in different directions, but mostly away from the satellite. An example of this type of scattering would be a water surface that has some level of roughness caused by either short floating vegetation, wind, or heavy rain. Such an area would appear dark, but not as dark as a water surface that is completely smooth. The rougher the surface, the larger the signal scattered back to the satellite, and the brighter that pixel will appear on the image. The next signal interaction is volume scattering, which occurs when the signal is scattered multiple times and in multiple directions within a volume or medium. 
In the case of vegetation, the signal can scatter from multiple components, such as branches, stems, leaves, trunks, or the soil. The final backscatter mechanism on the far right is called double bounce, which results when two smooth surfaces create a right angle that deflect the incoming radar signal off both surfaces, causing most of the energy to be returned to the sensor, to the satellite. These areas appear very bright in the image and are commonly seen when there is flooded vegetation because of the interaction between the smooth water surface and the vertical structure of vegetation, such as the trunk. Double bounce is also characteristic of urban areas. This is an example of SAR signal scattering over inundated areas. So this figure is an L-band HH polarized image from the Pulsar sensor on board the Japanese ALO satellite over an area near Manaus, Brazil. It clearly shows flooded vegetation as the very bright areas and open water as the dark areas. The river running through the middle is dark because open water is a smooth surface and it causes specular scattering. All of the very bright white areas, those are caused by double bounce and those areas are flooded vegetation. The striking part about this image is that in some areas you cannot see specular scattering. You cannot see open water from the river because it's either the river is too small or it's covered by vegetation. But you can see its extent through flooded vegetation because the signal is penetrating through the canopy and double bounce is occurring. So radar is truly unique and it's ideal for monitoring flooded vegetation as you can see. That's, that's really um, the value, one of the great values of radar is in detecting flooded vegetation and also easily detecting open water. As you know from the previous material, backscatter is dependent on surface properties related to structure and dielectric. There are three parameters related to structure, size relative to wavelength, orientation, and density. In radar, the length of the wave or the wavelength will determine its interaction with surface objects. In the previous slide, we talked about specular scattering, which is when the signal scatters away from the satellite because the surface is smooth. The smoothness of the surface is wavelength dependent. A surface is considered rough if its surface structure has dimensions that are comparable to the length of the wave. So if wind ripples on the surface of the water are relative to the wavelength, then the surface will appear rough. Remember that the darker the pixel, the smoother the surface in relation to the wavelength. As the surface roughness increases, the backscatter intensity will increase. And in the case of open water, as the surface roughness increases, the brighter the pixel. Orientation influences the interaction of the waves that are either horizontally or vertically polarized. I'll talk to, about polarization in a couple more slides. But if you remember, one of the scattering mechanisms is called double bounce, which is characteristic of flooded vegetation and occurs when there are two surfaces creating right angles such as a water surface and a trunk, resulting in most of the radar signal scattering back to the satellite and appearing very bright. If the orientation of the trunks are not perpendicular to the water surface, then double bounce will not occur. Finally, the density of the scatterers and the biomass in the case of flooded vegetation will also influence the double bounce signal return. The greater the biomass, the less penetration through the canopy, and this is also a function of wavelength. Um, and the greater the density of scatterers, the less the penetration. If there are gaps in the vegetation canopy, there is a larger likelihood for the signal to penetrate all the way through. The satellite parameters that influence the SAR signal response are wavelength, polarization, and incidence angle. And I'll start with wavelength. Generally, the longer the wavelength, the greater the capability of the SAR signal to 
penetrate through the vegetation canopy all the way to the surface. The table on the right lists commonly used bands in radar and their wavelength range. SARs operating at X band are generally operating at a wavelength of around 3 centimeters, at C band at a wavelength of around 5 centimeters, and at L band at a wavelength of around 23 to 24 centimeters. And as you can notice, the range is quite wide. There have been several studies that have concluded that L band is suited to detect inundation beneath a forested canopy and should be the preferred wavelength for this purpose. However, that capability of L-band and also of other bands to penetrate some forested areas can be reduced or are even non-existent depending on the gaps in the ca canopy or especially on the vegetation density. And I always like to give this example. A couple of years ago, we were conducting uh, some wetland studies in the Peruvian Amazon and we overflew the area with an airborne sensor, an L-band airborne sensor called UAVSAR over our site of interest. And at the same time, we had someone on the ground collecting in situ data. This person on the ground was in water up to his knees. However, the radar data that was collected did not see any flooded vegetation because the vegetation was simply too dense for the signal to penetrate penetrate all the way through the canopy. So in comparison to L-band, the ability of shorter wavelengths such as C-band or X-band to penetrate vegetation canopy is reduced. And also the penetration of C-band is limited in comparison to L-band. Study, studies have shown an increase in C-band backscatter for flooded vegetation during leaf on conditions and especially during leaf off conditions. C-band is especially useful if the density of the vegetation is low and works particularly well in agricultural regions. X-band sensors, for example, Terrasar X, in general have more limited penetration through dense vegetation as a result of the high interference with leaves where backscatter is dominated by volume scattering. However, there are, have been some studies that have shown the potential of X-band to identify flooded vegetation for sparse vegetation or during the leaf-off conditions. So in this case, the transmissivity of the signal through the canopy is increased due to gaps in the canopy or very low biomass and the contribution of double bounds dominating the volume scattering. Some other studies have demonstrated the ability of X-band to map flooded vegetation in wetlands, in flooded marshlands, and in olive groves. In summary, L-band is better suited for dense vegetation, but shorter wavelengths might give you reasonable results, especially if there are many gaps in the vegetation. And the shorter the wavelength, the shorter wavelengths are better suited for low density vegetation. And here's an example of signal penetration through vegetation to detect flooding at different frequencies. So we have C-band, L-band, and P-bands. And these images were acquired with JPL's multi-frequency airborne radar called AirSAR. It's no longer operational, but these uh, images were acquired over Manu National Park in Peru. And it's a wetland. Uh, these were acquired in 1993. So remember that C-band has a wavelength of around 5 centimeters, L-band around 24, and P-band around 40 centimeters. And as you would expect, the longer the wavelength, the greater the penetration through the canopy, and the better the uh, probability of detecting flooded vegetation. The white areas, the bright white areas, are flooded vegetation. And note all of the white areas in the P-band image that are either not present or less bright and extensive in the L-band image or the C-band image, where there is hardly any flooded vegetation detected. Now let's discuss the other radar parameter that influences the signal interaction with the surface, and that is polarization. Polarization refers to the plane of propagation of the electric field of the signal which can be 
in the horizontal plane or in the vertical plane. Irrespective of wavelength, radar signals can be transmitted and or received in different modes of polarization. There can be four combinations of both transmit and receive polarizations, which are HH, that means horizontally transmitted, vertically received, VV, vertically transmitted, vertically received, HV, horizontally transmitted, vertically received, and VH, vertically transmitted and horizontally received. Penetration depth is influenced by polarization. In forests, HH tends to penetrate deeper into the canopy because it tends to be less attenuated than VV. HV is more sensitive to volume scattering and is hence a good indicator of vegetation cover. Here we have an example of multipolarization images from the Pulsar sensor on board the ALOS satellite, which is a Japanese satellite. And these are over Pacaya Samaria Natural Reserve in Peru. And this is a vast wetland ecosystem. These are L-band images at HH, HV, and VV polarizations. As you already know, the very bright areas are where double bounce dominates and this is where there is inundated vegetation. The very dark areas are open water. You can clearly see the river running through the middle of the image, as well as some small open water bodies north and south of the river. Um, note the difference in backscatter magnitude between the different polarizations. If you focus on inundated vegetation or the, those very bright areas, uh, those areas dominated by double bounds, HH polarization is the most useful for distinguishing flooded vegetation from non-flooded vegetation. VV shows flooded vegetation to a lesser extent and HV to an even lesser extent. So in general, HH polarization penetrates deeper into the ve vegetation canopy than VV and when striking the water surface is most strongly reflected in comparison to VV polarization. HV is more sensitive to volume scattering because of its depolarizing characteristics and is generally not good to detect uh, inundated vegetation. Here I want to show how you can display the image in a way that you can understand the information content of the different polarizations. So this is an RGB image with HH, HV, and VV, the same three images uh, that you saw in the previous slide. And this is what's called a false color image. It's an ideal way to visualize the information content of different polarizations through color combinations because you can see the information content that is unique to each polarization or combinations of polarizations. Here we have HH in the red channel, HV in the green channel, and VV in the blue channel. The pink areas are those where flooded vegetation is present. So we talked about multiple polarizations for detecting flooded vegetation, right? So we're looking at double bounds. This example shows multiple polarizations for detecting open water which is specular scattering. And here we have a pulsar image for an area near Manaus, Brazil, at the same three polarizations as before, HH, HV, and VV. Note the backscatter intensity over the river that goes through the middle of the image. Open water is a smooth surface which causes specular reflection, resulting in the radar signal being scattered away from the satellite and therefore appearing very dark in the image. And here you can see that open water is much darker at HV than at HH or, v A or VV, and hence it's easier to differentiate at HV. The reason for this is that since water is a smooth surface scatterer, there is no depolarization of the signal. The last radar parameter I'd like to discuss is incidence angle. The utility of SAR data for detecting flooded vegetation is influenced significantly by the incidence angle. So incidence angle is that angle between the direction of the incident wave 
and the Earth's surface plane. In radar, the incidence angle increases across the swath from the near range to the far range. The area closest to the satellite is the near range, and you'll find smaller incidence angles than the area furthest away from the satellite, or what's called the far range. Small or low incidence angles perpendicular to the surface will result in greater penetration through the medium and higher backscatter than large incidence angles. Large angles, on the other hand, will be more sensitive to surface roughness and will penetrate less into the medium. For the detection of flooded vegetation, steeper incidence angles are preferred because the signal has greater, greater penetration through the canopy and reaches the water surface underneath, or it has a higher probability of reaching the water surface underneath the vegetation canopy. The large incidence angles will be more sensitive to vegetation structure and less likely to penetrate through the canopy and detect flooded vegetation. This is an example of the effect of incidence angle variation. On the left is the Sentinel-1 image, it's VV polarization, C-band, and on the right is the incidence angle variation for the same image. That radar is right looking, and as we move across the swath from the near to the far range, the image becomes increasingly darker in tone, around 3 to 5 dB difference in backscatter. If you measure, for example, the same forest at different incidence angles, then the, the, the backscatter will be different, even if there has been no physical change in the forest. Every surface feature will have a backscatter that is a function of incidence angle, so you need to be very careful when comparing, comparing backscatter of a feature when there is a large variation in incidence angle. An incidence angle can especially affect the appearance of smooth targets on the image, such as open water. Smooth surfaces can appear brighter than rough surfaces at small incidence angles, usually less than 20-25 degrees. The following examples indicate sources of confusion. So for example, when detecting open water, Sometimes it might not be as straightforward because wind can cause ripples on the surface of the water and backscatter might not be as dark as expected. So what you're seeing here is a pulsar image over an area where you can see roughness on the surface of the water of the main channel. And this roughness is likely caused by windy conditions. As you move east and up the tributary, there is smooth water becoming more of a specular scatterer, and as a result, the backscatter decreases both in HH and VV polarizations. However, notice that HV is the most suited to detect open water because um, the signal does not depolarize, and open water will consistently be dark, be very dark at HV. Another source of confusion is between open water and low vegetation. And this might lead to errors when classifying open water. You might be classifying areas that have been deforested or agricultural areas as open water. What we're seeing here is a pulsar image. This is near Manaus, Brazil, HHHV and VV. And you can see that the water is dark, but north of the river, there are areas that are that have no vegetation or have very low vegetation and these areas look very similar to open water and one way to try to clear this up is using image ratios such as HH over HV. The final source of confusion that I want to discuss is when classifying flooded vegetation and sometimes flooded vegetation can be confused to urban areas. And here we have a pulsar image containing the city of Manaus in Brazil and its surroundings. So Manaus here is labeled in the northern part of the image. It clearly shows flooded vegetation are the bright areas around the river. And the city of Manaus, which is a quite a large city, it has about 2.5 million people, including its suburbs, also appears very bright. 
as bright as flooded vegetation. And this is because the dominating scattering mechanism is the same thing, it's double bounce. Right angles form between smooth surfaces, such as uh, in the case of urban areas, roads and vertical structures, such as buildings, causing this high return, causing the double bounce. And one way to at least partly clear up this confusion is through the use of texture measurements. Textures provide information about the statistics of the pixels within a box, which size is defined, that the size of the box is defined by the user. And some textures, such as energy or entropy, provide information about homogeneity or in inhomogeneity of the pixels within the box. In my experience, such measures help separate urban areas from flooded areas because urban areas tend to be more homogeneous than flooded areas. Here I've illustrated images of that same area at different polarizations. You can see that at HH, both urban and flooded areas are very discernible. At VV, urban areas are more discernible than flooded vegetation. The reason for this is because the signal is attenuated by vegetation, but not at the same level by urban areas. And at HV, urban areas are minimally discernible, but so are flooded areas. After showing these slides, you might be asking yourself whether uh, radar is good for monitoring urban flooding. And the answer is that the backscatter signal is not that useful for monitoring flooding in urban areas because double bounce still dominates when urban areas are flooded. Under flooded conditions, the smooth surface, instead of being a road, is a water surface, and the vertical structure remains the same, which are the buildings. Radar is useful in assessing inundation in open areas within the urban environment, such as parks or golf courses or that urban-rural interface. And this example shows just that. It's flooding that has occurred in the city and surroundings of Houston, Texas in the United States. This flooding was caused by a large hurricane that occurred there in 2017 called Hurricane Harvey. There are, these are radar images from the European Space Agency Sentinel-1 satellite, SAR satellite, and these are during and after the event. The images cover an area of approximately 220 by 190 kilometers, and the area marked with the red circle is the city of Houston, the metropolitan city of Houston, um, as well as some of its suburbs. There is no significant change in brightness over the city itself. However, inundation in the surroundings is discernible because ponding of water forms these smooth surfaces that create specular scattering, and those areas appear dark. Note that some of the water bodies that are present in the middle image, which I have noted with red arrows, that are not present in the far left or far right images. Also note the disappearance of some of these water bodies a couple of days after the event on September 5th. Again, a great way to visualize the unique information content when you have several images is to create a false color composite through an RGB. And here I've used two images, one before and the other one during the event. So channels R and B contain the during the event image from August 30th, while the green channel contains before the event image from August 18th. The area where there is a predominant color means that the backscatter value for that area was higher in the image containing that color or combination of colors. For example, anything that is green means that backscatter was higher before the event. Areas that are pink means that the red and blue channel values, which in this case are the same, are higher than the green channel. So anything that is green means that backscatter was higher before the event. This is another example of radar. These are uh, images before the event and after the event. This is a hurricane that stuck, struck the east coast of the United States, causing coastal flooding. 
These are Sentinel-1 radar images, and the false color images are VV, VH, and the ratio of VV and VH for each date. Uh, uh, Hurricane Matthew caused major flooding in this area. This was in October of 2016. And the orange areas that pop up along the coastline after the event indicates that these areas are inundated. So in summary, SAR backscatter is not good at assessing flooding in strictly urban areas, but can assess flooding in the human natural interface within or surrounding urban areas. Finally, the last thing I want to discuss and something that you should keep in mind are geometric distortions in radar images due to topography. And these are very common in radar images. These are distortions similar to those encountered when using cameras and scanners. Radar images are also subject to geometric distortions due to relief displacement. And this displacement occurs perpendicular to the flight path. Displacement is reversed, however, with targets being displaced towards instead of away from the sensor. Radar foreshortening and layover are two consequences which result from the relief displacement. So layover occurs when the radar beam reaches the top of a tall feature before it reaches the base. As a result, the top of the feature is displaced towards the radar from its true position on the ground, and then it lays over the base of the feature. Uh, layover tends to be most severe for small incidence angles at the near range of a swath and in mountainous terrain. Foreshortening occurs when the radar beam reaches the base of a tall feature that's tilted towards the radar, so for example a mountain, uh, before it reaches the top. And this distortion increases with small look angles and steep slopes. Because the radar measures distance in slant range, the, the slope of A to B will appear compressed, and the length of the slope will be represented incorrectly. So depending on the angle of the hillside or the mountain slope in relation to the incidence angle of the radar beam, the severity of foreshortening will vary. Maximum foreshortening occurs when the radar beam is perpendicular to the slope, such that the slope the base and the top are imaged simple, simultaneously. And these distortions can complicate SAR-derived flood class classifications in severe cases. The layover and shadowing produced by mountainous terrain make classification inappropriate. In less severe cases, ancillary digital elevation data can be used to generate approximate corrections for terrain effects prior to classification. The final effect that topography can have on the signal is called shadowing, and this occurs when the radar beam is not able to illuminate the ground surface. Shadows occur behind the vertical features or slopes with steep sides. And uh, since the radar beam just does not illuminate the surface, these regions behind the mountain or behind the, the slopes appear dark. There's no energy that's available to be backscattered. And as incidence angle increases from near to far range, so will shadow effects as the radar beam looks more and more obliquely at the surface. And these shadows can be easily confused with open water when mapping inundation. There are ways to correct for shadows through interpolation, uh, through the use of DMs and, and interpolations. However, I personally prefer to leave the shadow areas as areas of data gaps rather than using interpolated values. And one final thing to consider when doing a flood map classification is something called speckle, which is the salt and pepper appearance of radar images. And in order to reduce the effect of speckle, you need to apply a filter, which will reduce the resolution of your image. So keep in mind that radar images, they might be posted at a given resolution, say 10 meters. After, however, after applying a filter on an individual image, that spatial resolution will be lower. So I've talked about these distortions that you should account for. 
In previous trainings, we used the Sentinel toolbox and we went through different steps on how to correct for some of these distortions. So we did radiometric corrections and we did uh, geometric corrections. With the Sentinel toolbox, these corrections have already been made. So these images are ready to be analyzed. This last example is that of radiometric distortion over areas of topography, especially complex topography. Wherever you have slopes facing the satellite, you'll get a bright return, which sometimes are, these returns are bright enough to be confused with flooded areas. And this example shows an area in the Andes. This is a Sentinel-1 radar image. You can partly correct this by performing a radiometric correction to your data. In Google Earth Engine, the radiometric correction of the SAR images from Sentinel-1 has already been applied. However, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you can sometimes not fully correct for this. You'll still have a high return over areas of complex topography, which might be confused with uh, flooded areas. So if you're looking at flooded vegetation or flooded areas in, areas in, in um, higher elevations or complex topography, it might be a, a bit more difficult to characterize those areas because of the topography effect. SAR data sets have improved significantly in the past couple of years, and this list shows the legacy, current, and future SAR data sets. The ones that are in a green box indicate that the data are freely available. And you can access these data either through the Alaska Satellite Facility or through the European Space Agency's Copernicus Hub. Legacy data sets such as CSAT in 1978, which flew only for a couple months, uh, there's JRS-1, ERS-1 and 2 going through the 2000s, NVSAT, ALOS-1 and RadarSat-1. Currently, there are a number of SAR satellites in orbit uh, with Tandem-X, which is an X-band radar satellite from the German Aerospace Center, uh, RadarSat-2, which is C-band from the Canadian Space Agency, Cosmos SkyMed, which is an Italian X-band SAR, Sentinel-1, which is a European Space Agency SAR operating at C-band, um, PASSAR, which is a Spanish SAR operating at X-band. Uh, there's also uh, SALCOM, which is an Argentinian Space Agency L-band sensor. There are also future satellites uh, coming up. NISAR, it's a uh, NASA Indian Space Agency collaboration. It's an L-band and S-band SAR sensor. Um, there's also Biomass, a European Space Agency P-band sensor. And therefore, these are very exciting times, uh, not only now that we have uh, Sentinel-1 C-band SAR data available freely and openly available. There's also upcoming satellite radar sa uh, data sets that will be openly available. I'd like to briefly touch on NISAR, which is a NASA Indian Space Agency satellite to be launched in early 2022 and will operate at L and S bands. The data will be open and freely available. It will have a 3 to 10 meter resolution depending on its mode of operation and it will have a 12 day temporal repeat. And it will provide repeated observations which will allow for a number of different applications in ecosystems, hazards, disaster monitoring that include ecosystem disturbances, ice sheet collapse, natural hazards such as earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, um, floods. So uh, very exciting times ahead with this upcoming mission. Now I'll start the demo. I'll walk you through how to use Google Earth Engine to do flood mapping using SAR data. Google Earth Engine is a great resource. It's, cloud, it's a cloud-based geospatial processing platform, and it's available to scientists, researchers, and developers for analysis of Earth's surface. It's uh, free to sign up for an account. You do need to have an account in, a, in, a, in order to uh, use it. And it contains a catalog of satellite imagery and geospatial data sets, including Sentinel-1. So it's got the entire Sentinel-1 SAR database. 
and it uses a, a JavaScript code editor. And once you have an account, then this is what the Google Earth Engine code editor looks like. And you can see that there are different uh, windows in this interface. You've got the actual code editor. You can uh, save it. You can search for data sets. There's a help button, uh, task manager. There are many different options as explained here. The SAR database that you can find on Google Earth Engine is from Sentinel-1. This is a SAR sensor from the European Space Agency. It's a C-band SAR sensor. And they have two satellites in space, A, Sentinel-1A, and Sentinel-1B. Each satellite has a global coverage every 12 days. And there is, so between the two of them, there's coverage every six days. Sentinel-1 has different modes of operation. There's the extra wide swath mode, then that's for monitoring oceans and, coast, and coasts. There is the strip mode, and that's by special order only, and it's intended for special needs like disasters. There's the wave mode, which is a routine collections for the ocean. And then there's the interferometric wide swath mode, which is the routine collection for land. And this is the one you want to use for flood mapping. If you go to the following link, you can access a page that has a description of the Sentinel-1 catalog. It explains the different modes of images that are housed on Google Earth Engine as, as described in the previous slide. All of the images are in GRD, that means they're uh, in the ground range projection. And depending on the mode, they might come in different polarizations as well as resolutions. The processing that has been applied to the images has been using the Sentinel toolbox, and they have um, applied the thermal noise removal. They've applied the radiometric calibration, as well as the terrain correction. So these images are basically ready to be used for analysis. The only thing you might need to do is to apply a speckle filter and actually we'll do that as part of this demo. The demo is going to be focused in Mozambique. So Mozambique was hit by a cyclone called Idai in March of 2019 and large floods occurred as a result. So this was one of the worst tropical cyclones on record to affect Africa and the Southern Hemisphere. The long-lived storm caused catastrophic damage in not only Mozambique, but also in Zimbabwe and Malawi, leaving more than 1,200 people dead and thousands more missing. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is visualize Sentinel-1 data. Uh, so let's start out by opening Google Earth Engine. Now, as I mentioned, Google Earth Engine is a great platform for analysis of remote sensing data sets. And the, great, the advantage is that this analysis can be done on the cloud. And for those of you that have taken previous SAR trainings, you might recall that the demo uh, required the participants to download a Sentinel SAR or Pulsar SAR image into their computers and then use the Sentinel toolbox, also known as the SNAP software, to do the processing of the SAR images. The, the, this was a, a bit of a cumbersome task because one, the SAR images are very large on the order of one to two gigabytes. Uh, so you need a good connection to la download the images or the image or images. And you also need a powerful computer with lots of memory to not only store the files, but to perform the different processing steps on the SAR data. A G, it, uh, Google Earth Engine uh, bypasses that need because everything is done on the cloud. Now, in order to start Google Earth Engine, you need to set up an account. Uh, and you need to apply for it. So you basically request 
uh, an account, you write the reason uh, for requesting it, what you plan to do uh, with the data, and they'll issue you a license usually within a day or two. And once you log in, you'll get a screen that looks like this. So this is your editor, your Google Earth Engine editor. And this is the script editor. All the processing works on scripts. And here, you in the middle, you write the scripts that uh, you, you're working on. And over here, under docs, is documentation of all the functions that are pre-built into Google Earth Engine code editor. Um, inspector allows you to uh, get data from the map itself and then consoles, so any messages or, or, or information that is being output is printed there onto the console. And then tasks, you can send things that you can make with Google Earth Engine uh, and they will be exported and you can send things to your Google Drive. So as mentioned, Google Earth Engine works on scripts, so you'll utilize uh, JavaScript. You can also install Python if you wish. Uh, there are many resources online to become familiar with working with scripts or writing your own scripts. However, the best way to learn is to practice. So there is a learning curve here. Okay, so here's where we're going to write our script. Uh, once you write something, you run it. And if there's an error, there'll be an indicator of where that error is located. So you, you'll have a message out here, usually. Uh, so I'll start with displaying the data. We will add a Sentinel-1 to script editor. Um, and so you want to, uh, as I mentioned, there are many different uh, data sets on Google Earth Engine. And if you type in Sentinel-1, you can, there's Sentinel-1, you search for it, and you click here. So up pops a window that has all the characteristics of the Sentinel-1 data set that is housed on Google Earth Engine platform. It just the processing steps that were applied. I discussed these earlier, the polarizations and spatial resolutions. And then it's got a table, a very long table of image properties. And basically, uh, it's got a lot of information there, but the most important image property to be aware of is, are the instrument mode, this one. So we talked about different imaging modes, and we want to use interferometric wide swath, which is IW. And then there is the resolution, the polarization. So those are the ones to uh, be on the lookout for. And oh, the orbit properties pass, so either ascending or descending. You do want to filter for for those. Okay, so we'll close that, and then let's go back to our PowerPoint. And we will go to the next one. So first of all, we will select our area of interest. As mentioned, this is an area in Mozambique. And so if you zoom into Mozambique, you'll see the city of Beira. And we'll draw a line. We'll delineate our area of interest. And the way to do that is on Google Earth Engine, you've got a drawing tool option. And so we'll use that to define our area of interest. We'll, we'll draw a rectangle similar to the one that's here. 
Okay, and then we'll rename geometry. So up here is the area delineated, and we'll it's the original. It will be originally called geometry. We'll rename that to ROI, which means area of interest. Okay, so let's go back to Google Earth Engine. Here's the drawing tool, and we'll just kind of uh, draw a box and our area of interest. Okay. And I'll make it red there. And then we'll rename this ROI. Okay, so that is our area of interest. You can also select a point if you wish, or uh, you can uh, draw a shape or a rectangle. And if you want to edit that, you can just go under Geometry Imports, ROI, and select this here. And then you can rename your area of interest. And you can change the color. All right. So we'll go back to our PowerPoint. and. The next thing we want to do is filter the Sentinel-1 data. So we'll copy this code. And we'll paste it on our editor window. Okay, so I'll explain what this code means. Okay, so basically to load the Sentinel-1 data, um, you use the following, right? So you use, that's called the Copernicus-1 one, S1 one GRD. So this one, this data set is in the ground range projection. And you define a variable, right? So here we're calling it collection VV. And we'll, we're filtering that data set according to uh, the mode, IW mode, and according to VV polarization, descending pass, and resolution equals to 10 meters. Uh, one thing to remind you is anytime we do a classification, we always want to keep the passes separately. We don't want to mix ascending with descending because the viewing geometry is different and that's going to confuse things. So when you're running a classification, uh, run it with data that is strictly just ascending or strictly just descending. You can compare the results, but you should always keep those separate. So here we're uh, just working with descending data. And then we are also um, doing a filter for VH data. So it's exactly the same code, but instead we're instead of defining VV, we're defining VH. Okay. And these data sets are in log scale, by the way, in case you're wondering. So you run, anytime you have a script, you run it. Okay, so here's our image collection, the results of our image collection for VV and the results of our collection for VH. And there are 584 images, VV, and 423 right here for VH. All right, and if you, as, as mentioned here in the docs, here's a description of the functions that are in Google Earth Engine. So the one we used was uh, image collection. 
right? So right here, and it explains the the uh, terminology that's used to call this function. And the same way you can call the Sentinel-1 SAR dataset, you can also call other datasets that are in Google Earth Engine. Uh, there's Landsat, there are a number of different data sets in Google Earth Engine. Okay, so let's go to scripts and let's go back to our PowerPoint file. So, um, we go to the next one and the reason there it's a little different here from it, the results of the images falling into our area is a little different here in the PowerPoint than what you're running is because um, this demo has been pre-recorded. So there are a number of additional images since this demo was recorded, or also it might be that the size of your box is slightly different from the one I used, or both actually, both reasons. So that's the total number of images that uh, overlap our area of interest. And remember that Sentinel has been up there since the 2014, at least the first one. So it's quite a number of years of data collection. And so what we want to do is we want to filter that database by date. Okay. So what you do is you copy this code and we'll go to Google Earth Engine. And we will add that here at the bottom and select run. Okay, so what we're doing is we are filtering the code, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the data, the VV and the VH by date. Okay, so before the event, which is anywhere between February of uh, uh, 15th through February 24th of 2019, and after anywhere between March 15th to March 21st of 2019. Okay, so we use the same criteria with the uh, VH, the same search criteria. And then in the console, it shows the images the VV images before. So there are six VV images here, features six, and uh, b before the event in, uh, in VV. And there are six images that cover this area after the event. Okay. And the same thing with VH, six in VH before the event and six in VH after the event. So here back on the PowerPoint file, I, I've walked you through um, the steps, what we're doing on Google Earth Engine, um, including the output. So as we saw on Google Earth Engine, there are six images covering our area of interest before the event and six images covering that same area after the event. All right, so the next thing we want to do is display the Sentinel data uh, by date. So we want to display or have the option to display each individual image. And so let's uh, copy the script and we'll go back to our script editor and we'll paste that and then we run. All right, so here on layers, we've got actually the six images. And the reason it's blue, let's, so let's deselect. It shows you uh, the coverage. So let's just select one, layer one. And it's 
it's creating an RGB. So let's, so it's an RGB of actually the VV, the VH, and the angle. That's the incidence angle. So let's just display uh, the VV. Let's just display one image. We do need to specify the range. So let's say minus 15 to zero. Remember, these images are in log scale. So let's say zero, and we apply. So that is the VV image. And we can do the same uh, VH. The scale is, the range of values is a little different because it's VH. So let's um, apply. Okay, so you can do the same for each one. If you want to see the images individually. So let's close this. So let's do the same thing for image 2, VV, minus 15, 0, apply. Layer three. All right. Now, instead of working with the individual images, you can mosaic the images. And so that's what we're actually do. We'll create a mosaic of all these six images. So we're just dealing with one file rather than six individual files. I just wanted to go through this step so you could see if you want to actually inspect the individual images in your search results. That's one way to do it. But let's go back to the PowerPoint file. And um, we went through this step. Um, so let's now display it. And the way, display it as a mosaic. Okay. So the way to do this is you use the same code that you used previously, where you define the range of dates that you're searching before the event and the range of dates after the event. And then you add dot mosaic at the end, okay? So let's just copy this. Or actually, and then we display it. And here, when we display it, we're actually um, displaying it, uh, uh, stretching it according to um, the values, the general values in the image. Okay. So instead of having to manually stretch it like we just did, uh, we'll display it already stretched. So let's go back here. We'll just replace what we wrote here with the dot mosaic. And we'll replace the displaying as well with the code. Okay, so we've replaced the filter by date to mosaic it. So we have now four mosaics before and after in VV and VH, and we'll display these mosaics. Okay, so once it runs, then you go to layers. And you've got your four mosaics here on layers. Um, after the flood, VH, uh, before, and VV. All right, so in order to display them, you have to select them. And let's select after the flood. Uh, there is a, a gap here. There is a part of the coverage is missing. And let's do before the flood, VH. I mean, you can, you can already see just visually, right, that this area has been uh, flooded. There's been severe flooding around this area. So let's take a look at the VV image before, after, and before. Okay. So that's the way. And if you want to play around with how you're um, displaying it with the, the range of values, how you're stretching that image to display it, you can uh, go in and change that range of values. OK. 
Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint file. And the next step is to display in an RGB of uh, the image, okay? So what we'll do is we'll create an RGB with the before BH, after BH, and before BH. So we'll just focus on BH. Remember, BH is the best band to look at open water. So let's just do this. We'll copy this code and we'll go to our script editor and we'll paste it here in the bottom and we select run. Okay, and then in the layers, you've got a, a new image here that you can display. Okay, so what you're seeing here is before is um, before the event is R, after the event is green, and before the event is uh, blue. Okay, so we are using just two images, but basically what I want to show with this RGB is uh, the areas that were inundated and how they stand out. So you can clearly see all of these uh, pinkish, reddish areas. These were all areas that were inundated. So this is all standing water. And you can zoom in. It, sometimes it takes a little while to, to load up. And you can see some uh, pinkish down here, probably because the soil moisture is very, very high um, in comparison to the before. But let's focus on this area here. All of this is inundation. All of this along the river is inundated. Okay, so one thing we want to do is we want to apply a speckle filter. We, I talked about uh, speckle being this uh, noise-like effect in the original images, and sometimes it can be uh, difficult to generate a classification because you've got this salt and pepper effect on the images. So let's apply uh, speckle filter, copy this code. And basically it's just a, a smoothing filter. So let's copy the code and go here, paste it. So before we run it, I just want to zoom in so you can see further detail. All right, so let's run this. Okay, so what we're doing is we're applying the filter up here, smoothing radius. So if you want more smoothing, you increase this value of 50. This is just by trial and error, really. And if you want less smoothing, you decrease this number. And then what we're doing down here is we're displaying those filter images. Okay, so if you go to layers now, you'll see that we have four new images added on to our layers. Um, and these are all the filtered. So let's. Uh, I'll zoom in so you can see the difference. Oh. 
Okay, so that is so that's our filtered image. And let me just bring up our non filter. So that's after flooding VH filtered. And let me just bring up the after flooding. So that's filtered, not filtered. I'm not sure. Let me zoom in a little more, make sure you can see it on your screens. So that's not filtered. And that's filtered. Okay. So, so big difference. Okay. Um, as mentioned, you can play around with this. Part of Google Earth Engine is really just uh, playing around with it and becoming comfortable and familiar with uh, coding. So, let's um, stick to the filtered one and I'll zoom out. So let's go back to a PowerPoint. And here's what we just saw, the filter, the original and the filtered images. And so the next thing we want to do is to calculate the difference between before the event and after the event. So let's copy this code. So basically, this is just a difference, okay? So this is, um, we're taking the after the event and we're dividing it by before the event. The reason we're dividing is because these values are in dB, they're in logarithmic scale. So that, uh, that is uh, the, the difference between these two images. So let's just uh, hit run. So the result, if you go to layers, is a, a new image. You'll see here in the stack, in the layer stack, the one on top is the difference VH filtered image. Okay. So click on that and we'll display it. The bright areas are the areas that have been inundated. So if you wanna look at the pixel values, you go to inspector and let's just click anywhere here and you'll see the lat long of that point and you'll see the pixel value for all of the images in your stack. So let's zoom in. So I want you to understand these values. And let's just click here on a bright area. Okay, remember it's um, after minus before, right? So if after is, is dark because it's inundated, so it's very low and we can see the values here for that point that I clicked, it's a minus 29. So that area is very low. The backscatter is very low um, after the event. And before the event, it was minus 14 dB, right? So if you divide this, this is the difference, okay? And so any area that is very bright means that it's um, inundated inundated. So this area was all of the bright areas indicate inundation after the event. So that's open water um, after the event. Okay, and, and you can see the extent of the open water. So now let's uh, apply a mask to these areas. Let's go back to our PowerPoint file. And um, let's uh, create our threshold. Okay. So you copy this code and we'll go back to our script editor and we'll paste it. 
So this threshold, what we're saying is that anything above 1.25 will consider inundation, okay? In that difference image. And you can play around with this threshold and, and play around with different values. Um, so, so anything, the difference, VH, anything that's uh, greater than 1.25. So this is the threshold that we're setting, which is right here. Okay. And what we're doing down here is now we're adding to that layer. Uh, we're adding now a new layer, which is the difference VH threshold. So let's run this. And we'll go to layers. It's selected already. So all of the areas that are blue are areas where there's inundation. Okay, so we've created that threshold. If you lower the threshold, you might be able to capture more areas. If you increase the threshold, uh, you uh, select less areas. So notice that there are some areas that are being selected over here in the open water. Obviously, that, that is an error. We want to focus on the terrestrial, whatever is on land. OK, so uh, all of the blue areas are areas that are inundated. And one thing we can do is we can overlay the SAR image uh, over these masked areas. So let's just uh, keep the flooded areas blue selected. And let's select before flood VH filtered. OK, so now you have your original SAR image before. And you've got the inundated areas overlaid on the original SAR image. And that concludes our demo for today. Again, this is something very simple. It's to get you started to become familiar with Google Earth Engine, uh, the script editor, the, the different options. There's a lot more that you can do with Google Earth Engine. And it's just a matter of, uh, of practicing. So thank you very much. And I'd like to um, uh, display some of the, the contacts here. If you have any questions, um, you can uh, reach out to me or the RSET team. And I will open up the session now for questions and answers. Um, first question, is it possible to use SAR for grassland biomass estimation and what free sensors satellites should I use? Uh, yes, it is possible to use SAR for, um, for looking at grasslands, for biomass estimation, um, Probably, yes. I, I think there are papers out there that have done this type of thing. The best sort of sensor for this would be something of a low, a bit of a lower wavelength, so something like C-band, which is around 5.4 centimeters. And, um, and it would be a matter of digging up some uh, research papers to see what sort of techniques have been used for this specific um, application. And so when I talked about C-band, the sensor to use there would be from Sentinel-1. The next question, how can the HH polarization distinguish between flooded and unflooded vegetation? Okay, so HH polarization will penetrate a little further into the canopy and it will detect that standing water. So what happens when you have standing water underneath a vegetation canopy, that water acts as a smooth surface 
and the trunks in, in, in your canopy, in your vegetation, um, will reflect that energy, will cause double bounce. So, so the energy will be reflected from that smooth surface to the trunk and back to the satellite. And uh, there'll be uh, some, what's called, uh, uh, it's double bounce and the, the backscatter will be very, very bright. And that's how you can distinguish flooded areas, as you saw from the presentation. HH is, is better to look at flooded vegetation because it penetrates um, more through the canopy. You're more likely to reach the surface of the water than with VV or VH in areas of high biomass. Okay, the next question. Forecasters are worried that the 5G rollout may compromise weather forecasts. Are there similar concerns in relation to other satellite data, such as flood mapping? That's a good question. Um, the 5G uh, frequencies that are, are being discussed uh, will especially have an impact on atmospheric uh, forecasts, yes. And with some radar techniques like interferometric SAR, knowing the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is very important. And so you need to know these parameters in order to make some corrections um, because water vapor can really um, add some distortions to, to your data sets. And so it will have an impact for those specific type of applications. or it might have an impact for those specific type of applications. How does one normalize a SAR image to remove noise caused by the far range and near range effect? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, there are techniques, there are different ways to normalize it and uh, there, there are publications out there on how to do this. The best thing is to cut the edges where you've got the kind of the, the, the extremes on the edges, you know, ex, the extreme near range and ex, extreme far range. And so just work with kind of the center of the image where you don't have that large of a variation. That's, that's the best thing to do, All right? So then you have, you have a, a smaller area, but the signal, the incidence angle variation is not that large within your area. Why does VV polarization show better results than VH polarization in Sentinel-1 data sets of land use, land cover? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand this. I mean, when you say land use, land cover, that's very broad. And sometimes VV is the better polarization. If you're looking at, say, um, identifying a specific type of vegetation, one that has a lot of vertical structure, uh, then VV would uh, be a better polarization. If you're looking at identifying uh, vegetation versus not no vegetation, VH is a better polarization. So it just, it completely depends on what you want to do. What is the difference between SAR and INSAR? Is the processing and analysis of the two the same? Uh, so in SAR, we are using the intensity of the signal, that backscatter signal. With INSAR, we're using the phase of the signal. That's something um, that I didn't show here, but um, the processing is, yes, it is a little different. And we will have another uh, SAR uh, webinar series sometime in October, and we will be talking about INSAR in that seminar series. So we'll be focused on landslides and generating a digital elevation model. And also in uh, past SAR um, uh, trainings, we've, uh, we've touched on INSAR. What is the major difference between Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B? So I think this, there's a mistake, the person that wrote this question, because SAR is the Sentinel sensor that has a SAR, the Sentinel satellite that has a SAR sensor is Sentinel 1. 
Sentinel-2 has an optical sensor. So uh, Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B have the same sensor. It's, it's a C-band sensor. Each satellite has a 12-day repeat. And between the two of them, you get the six-day repeat. But it's the same, um, it's the same sensor configuration. How does one process ALO's pulsar data? So you would follow the same steps as processing Sentinel-1 data. Uh, the only difference is you don't apply the orbit file. Um, and the Alaska Satellite Facility has ALO's pulsar data in its archive. You can access this data set for free. And that data set spans from 2009, 2006, through early 2011, around that time frame, and the data, some of, most of the data, the pulsar data that they have, has been uh, geometrically, uh, radiometrically, and uh, geometrically corrected. So it's just ready to use. What does the gamma and palette refer to? The gamma refers to the values, and the palette refers to um, the colors that you want to assign. What is the range in layer band combination? How does one determine the range? So I think I showed this maybe a, a little later on before you posted this question. But if you go to uh, your code editor and you go under inspector and uh, you click on your image, uh, you'll see the value of that pixel. So you can click around your image to see, get a sense of the range of the values in your image. All right, the next question is, how does, question 11, how does one assess the values of the pixels to know the range? Okay, that one I answered. Are the features west of the ROI terrain? Or clouds? I'm not sure I understand question 12. So remember, SAR, with SAR, you don't have issues of clouds. You won't see clouds on SAR images. It's not like optical. So it's definitely not cl clouds. Um, it possibly, um, I, I'm not sure which sort of features you're referring to. It might be terrain. Can you elaborate on why you divide to find the difference of the VH? Is it because the values are negative? No, the reason I divide is because the values are, are nonlinear. They're dB, it's logarithmic. And so in order to do a difference, you need to divide. How do you arrive at the threshold value? Great question. So that is just trial and error. You go in, you look at, uh, you look at your values, and you set that threshold. And you can play around with the threshold, and you'll, and, and you'll see you might capture more flooding, but you might have some more noise or some more error in, uh, in the area that you're capturing as flooded. So, it's all um, just, you have to play around with that threshold and get a sense for the values in your image. Can you overlay the threshold images with areas and population data sets to create an automatic list of flooded regions as well as at risk populations, disaster, disaster managers, et cetera? Yes, actually, that's a great point. You can definitely do this type of stuff. And the, the great thing about Google Earth Engine is that You've got a lot of these data sets there. You just need to call them and overlay them. So same way we overlaid the radar image, 
uh, you can overlay uh, socioeconomic data. So you can you can overlay uh, infrastructure, roads, uh, population. Uh, you can overlay a DEM, for example, and uh, based on the DEM, the flatter regions identify the flatter regions as uh, uh, the ones more susceptible for to flooding. So you can do all kinds of really great stuff. And the nice thing is it's all on the cloud, so you don't have to really pull those data sets onto your computer. The next question, is it possible to monitor storm flood in more steep terrain given that they appear for a shorter period? Do you know any examples? Uh, it is possible, actually. The challenge here is the temporal resolution of the satellite, right? So you've got with Sentinel 1A and B, you've got a temporal repeat of every six days. So if you manage to capture an image at that point in time, and, and obviously you need something before as well for comparison. Then, then yes, you might be able to monitor some floods. Now, th there are issues in areas of complex topography. You've got, um, so sometimes you've got a layover or you've got a shadowing. So you've got things that might complicate um, your signal and that might confuse it with inundated vegetation or open water. Oh, okay, great question. How do we export the final output? Uh, so I talked about um, uh, the, the scripts, the docs section. It has a, a number of functions. And if you type export.image, uh, you'll, see, you'll see the uh, instructions on how to run that function. And so you're, there are different ways to export it. You can export it to your drive. You can export it to your assets. Uh, you can export it to the cloud, though you need, uh, you need an account. And um, you can export this as a, a geotiff, or you can export it as a, a raw file or a KMZ file. So there are different formats that you can export. You said that SAR is not good for mapping urban areas, but in the case of Idai, some of the affected area was in an urban area. Yes, that's a great point. So the reason SAR is not great for mapping in ur urban areas is because uh, there's some there's double bounds. I explained that, right? So that's what happens when you've got water underneath the vegetation, and uh, the signal bounces off of that flat, that specular surface to the trunk, back to the satellite, very bright in inundated vegetation. So in urban areas, it's a very similar case. In, but instead of um, instead of inundated vegetation, you've got streets that are smooth surfaces. You've got buildings that are uh, vertical structure, and so you get a double bounce even if conditions are not flooded, okay? So the street is smooth um, and your structure is very vertical, right? So you get double bounce in urban areas. When urban areas are flooded, that street now has water. It's still smooth, right? And so you get double bounce. And that's why it's very difficult to use radar to look at flooding in urban areas. However, not all urban areas are just streets and buildings. You've got open spaces in, in urban areas. And some areas are a bit more urban than others. Some are full of cement, others are not so, um, not so um, impervious. And so you've got open areas, you've got parks, you've got um, all, all kinds of different types of land cover within an urban area. And so, uh, that is why in Idai, uh, in, in the case of Idai, you can see that there was flooding in, um, in an urban area. 
in some of the urban areas. How does one normalize the star image to remove noise caused by the far range? Okay, I answered that one already, number 19. How can I export the image? I answered that one. What's the best approach to use for crop classification? Oh, it's great that you asked that because the next session in this webinar series is on using SAR for crop classification. And we have a guest speaker, Dr. Heather McNairn from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. She's an expert in the use of SAR for looking at agriculture. And the next demo will teach you how to use SAR for estimating soil moisture and crop classification. And even though we covered this topic in the last webinar last year, this builds on that webinar. So it's a bit more advanced and you'll learn some new skills. Okay, what is the spatial resolution of your result with Sentinel-1? That, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, I, the Sentinel-1 data is 10 meters resolution. However, when you apply the filter, you're reducing that resolution, and that's always going to be an issue. You remember, you always have to remember that with radar, the actual resolution is not the necessarily the final resolution of your product because with radar you always have this issue of speckle and in order to reduce speckle you you need to apply a filter which which uh, reduces your resolution so it totally depends how big the the uh, the window is for your filter the bigger that window the more you re reduce your resolution so in this case i believe the the after applying the filter the resolution of the image was 50 meters can you recommend an approach to detect flooded areas in mountainous terrain i would say uh, it's it's the same approach just follow the same approach but you really do need to go back and double check and make sure that what is being identified as flooded is indeed flooded and not areas that maybe are shadow or um, areas that are very bright because of uh, layover or foreshortening. Can you can we utilize SAR to monitor flooded grasslands? Absolutely, yes. You can you can SAR works very well for that. In fact, Sentinel One works very well for grasslands for looking at flooded grasslands. Yes. Okay. So, question for twenty five: Is it possible to have access to the Google Earth Engine script or slides? Absolutely. Uh, they can be found in the training web page. What is the benefit to processing SAR outside of Google Earth Engine? The benefit is that you get to do the processing yourself and you understand what are the steps. And I think there is something to be said about um, having an intuitive feel of what are what needs to be done to the image, what needs to be corrected. So that's why in the past we started these trainings using the SNAP um, software, which is uh, the European Space Agency's image processing software, which is free and open. And now we've moved to Google Earth Engine. And also, if you have your own processing code, you can apply that. So what the thing about Google Earth Engine is you're using um, what's there, right? So, so you're depending on the processing steps that they apply. If you have a different algorithm to apply the same processing steps, then you can do that yourself.
Are the Google Earth Engine data sets also available on Amazon Web Services? I, I'm, I don't know. I'd have to get back to you on that. Between the SLC and the GRD images, which is the best to go for when looking at doing land use classification? And is there a limitation on the number of classes that one may classify? Yeah, that's a great question. So you want to use the GRD images. The GRD images have uh, are ground projected. And so uh, for doing uh, land use classification, you want the images that are already properly projected. Um, the SLC are, are larger images, they're, they're complex images, and you'll use those for install. Is there a limitation on the number of classes that one may classify? Not really. It's, you'll see very quickly that limitation. So you might define 40 classes, and you'll see that uh, your classifier might not be correctly identifying all of them, and you'll have to clump the classes. So it totally depends on how different your classes are. And how many layers of information you have that might aid the classification. So for example, if you have multiple polarizations, you you'll have a higher rate of success in identifying different classes as opposed to having just one polarization. Is it possible to apply the future projection of different scenarios of climate change, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5? That's a good question. I, it is possible, and if that data set is on Google Earth Engine, uh, you can certainly uh, apply that. It's, it's a matter of uh, looking through the data sets that are housed on Google Earth Engine. Why do you apply a threshold to the SAR data? The reason I applied a threshold to the SAR data is because there was a clear distinction between the before and after. So in this case, inundation was open water. And when we did the differencing, it was uh, the, the, the bright areas were areas that were inundated, right? So it, when I applied the threshold, I was able to mask all of those areas. That's basically what we say. It was a mask of the areas that were inundated. Is it possible to detect change in intertidal mudflat area change? Is it possible to detect change in inner? Hmm. I'm not sure what sort of change you're talking about are you if you're talking about vegetation growth are you talking about deposition um, if it's vegetation for example yes you would be able to see this in the uh, in in the star images you would be able to see the difference between um, bare mud flats and, and, and vegetation growing so it, it, I think this question depends on what sort of change you're looking at. Can you use SAR data for habitat suitability modeling for wildlife? Yeah, of course. Again, this depends on what you mean by habitat suitability modeling. Are you talking about biomass? So perhaps uh, you'll find certain types of animals living in um, 
habitats that have given biomass. So that you can use SAR for. Are you looking at identifying wetlands? So for example, birds that like to, um, that, that um, make their homes in, in wetlands, you can use SAR to identify wetlands and whether they're inundated. So yeah, you can use SAR definitely for looking at or identifying different types of habitats. Okay, a great question here. Is there any way to reduce salt pepper effect without losing the spatial resolution? Yeah, okay, so you can do, if you have a time series of images, you can do a time series averaging. And so you wouldn't necessarily lose the spatial resolution. However, you might lose the, the, the information, the change in the signal across time. If you're doing an average. But if you're applying a speckle filter on individual images, you'll always lose spatial resolution. And there are a bunch, as you saw um, in previous SAR uh, 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 webinars, when we used the SNAP software, we applied a speckle filter. And that SNAP software has a number of different filters. There are many different filters out there. And some might do a slightly better job in keeping that, that spatial detail. But you'll always lose some, some resolution. Is it possible to use SAR imagery for monitoring, estimating soil water contents for agricultural purpose? Yes, absolutely. In fact, as mentioned earlier, the next webinar, which is next Wednesday at the same time, is going to cover this exact topic, the use of SAR for estimating soil moisture in agricultural areas. Is it possible to do processing of the SLC data in Google Earth Engine? That's a great question. I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Can DINSAR be utilized on Google Earth Engine to detect uh, deformation? Um, as far as I know, no. You don't have that, that capability on Google Earth Engine. There are incident angle bands contained in the VV or VH images in Google Earth Engine. How do you make use of this incident angle band in the calculation? That's great. Okay, so uh, the way you do it, and this would be more um, more relevant to things like open water. So what you want to do is you have to be careful sometimes because the incident angle will have an effect on the backscatter. So you might be looking at the same land cover class or feature. So say you're looking at an open water body or a forest. So that same open water body or forest might look a little different at different incident angles. And you can account for that. Uh, using that incidence angle band information. So in this example, we don't, we didn't use it. But if you're doing something like a land cover classification, you might want to train your classifier to account for the incidence angle variation. If your class looks very different 
So that's something you have to investigate. And so maybe as you're training your classifier, you can say, okay, well, this is forest at 30 degree incidence angle, and then this is forest at 45 degree incidence angle. Can SAR be used to identify different species of mangroves? Uh, yes, and I believe there are several publications about this, um, especially if the different species of mangroves are structure, structurally very different, then yes, SAR, SAR um, will differentiate them. Is it possible to study urban expansion using SAR? Is Sentinel-1 capable of doing this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially if, if, uh, if it's significant, uh, you'll, you'll see urban expansion even with optical data. But yeah, you can certainly use SAR data to look at urban expansion. Where can we find, oh, sorry. Uh, what is the processing and procedure required for the texture analysis in cases of complex topography? So what you wanna do in areas of complex topography is the same thing you do in general in the processing of the image, which is you wanna do a radiometric and geometric collection. Where can we find high resolution images for a local use and can it be used for monitoring irrigation? Yeah, actually this is gonna be covered in the next um, webinar on how to uh, use SAR for looking at uh, irrigation. And where can we find high resolution images? So the only operational SAR data set that you can access at the moment that I'm aware of is Sentinel-1 data. And, and uh, I saw that one of the comments, someone made a, a, a very uh, a important comment and good comment, is that in the data sets that I showed you about satellite sensors that contain SAR and the data that's really available, someone pointed out that RadarSat-1 is available and that is correct. Uh, RadarSat-1, it's a Canadian uh, SAR sensor, and they recently opened that data set. It, they have um, over 36,000 historical RadarSat-1 satellite images available to the public. And RadarSat-1 launch, launched in November 1995, and it operated for 17 years. So that's uh, quite a, a bit of data set. It's not operational, but it's a, a data set that you can use to do historic analysis and, and, and or use as a baseline. And that data set can be downloaded through the Canadian Space Agency directly. They have a website. Okay, so that concludes, I think I've answered all of your questions here. That concludes the session. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. And stay tuned for the next session, which will be next Wednesday, September 4th, at the same time. We'll have Dr. Heather McNairn, and she'll be talking about how to use SAR for looking at um, agriculture, identifying crops, calculating soil moisture. I'll, uh, I'm wishing you all a great day, and I'll see you in the next session. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.